very concerned about um, uh, the, the actions uh, of the new young leader and uh, very belligerent and the, and the rhetoric that has been emanating from um, the North Korean regime. But we have seen that threat become geographically dispersed um, as affiliated groups and groups sympathetic to Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda's message uh, have grown uh, in areas, for example, in North Africa. What is happening in the cyber arena cuts across any of our disciplines, whether it be counterintelligence or counterterrorism, as well as criminal. North Korea, the threat from Al-Qaeda and cyber attacks from possibly Russia, China, or Iran, uh, all talked about today at this Threats of the World uh, hearing up on Capitol Hill. We're back with the panel. Uh, Charles. Look, I think there are two kinds of threats. The ones that are the long-term ones that are targeted at us, and that would include, of course, um, Al-Qaeda and spreading around the world, even though the core Al-Qaeda is obviously diminished. The ideology, the murderousness remains unchanged. Second is the cybersecurity, which is an issue that we really... We've never suffered a Pearl Harbor. We, we can imagine it, but we're not even sure what it would look like. But apart from the long-term threats, and then, of course, in that list is uh, Pyongyang and, of course, China in the longer run, is the immediate threat to world peace. And I think the paramount one, the one that sort of interestingly sort of slipped out of our consciousness, is Iran going nuclear. Remember, it was a year ago when our Secretary of Defense, Panetta, said, that by six months ago, Israel would already have attacked Iran. And when the Prime Minister of Israel spoke at the General Assembly, he had the cartoon bomb and he said, we're going to reach a critical moment in spring or summer. Well, spring starts next week. Okay. Pause for dramatic effect. Thank you. Um, I could say, you know, the 20th of March and the equinox and all that, but <laughs> I thought I'd, I didn't really have to elaborate at that point. <laughs> uh, Kirsten, at one point during this hearing, the National Intelligence Director was asked about Benghazi, and he was asked what lessons might have been learned uh, from the 9-11 attack in Libya. I think one lesson uh, in this is uh, a greater force on, a greater emphasis on the intelligence community on um, force protection for our diplomatic facilities. And that clearly was, I think, a, a shortfall for us, having a, a better appreciation of the tactical situation on a, a, a diplomatic facility by di diplomatic facility. I guess the other lesson learned is uh, don't do talking points, unclassified talking points. That's the lesson I learned. How about that, Kirsten? <laughs> uh, obviously referring mm -hmm. to Ambassador Something Susan Rice and her yeah. relying on talking points. Well, I mean, I thought it was interesting. Uh, he, the, he, got an, he mentioned in the hearing about this pre-9-11 mindset, but he didn't really link it so much with Benghazi. But I, I do think that that was a little bit of what happened there, is that they, they didn't have anybody on alert in the area. And, um, and, he, and I thought, to me, this was the most interesting and most important part of, of the testimony, which is taking us back to the 90s, the pre, when we really had a pre-9-11 mindset and we're cutting intelligence and they cut the intelligence community by 23 percent and he was just really talking about the fact that we need to not get into that mindset again and how sequestration is affecting the intelligence community um, and that we need and I, I think that's the biggest thing with Benghazi and in a lot of other areas that we are really falling back into that mindset. Steve? Well I actually agree with DNI Clapper that one of the lessons is that the intelligence community shouldn't be doing talking points for policymakers. It's not an appropriate role. But I would say, if you do talking points, don't edit them and allow them to be politicized in the way that they were. The, the bigger takeaway, it was so interesting to watch th these hearings because of the apparent consensus, well, everybody up there, that Al-Qaeda is such a severely diminished threat that you know, nobody said we don't need to worry about it, but the, 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 the clear message out of the hearings was that the potential for a strike on the homeland is minimal. And they even, uh, I thought, downplayed the potential threats of the growing Al-Qaeda, um, you know, the geographic distribution and strengthening of Al-Qaeda uh, in the region. I just think it's, a, it, it's something that it, I was watching it and thinking, this is a hearing we could see played back later after an attack. To that point uh, about the diminished effectiveness of Al-Qaeda, uh, here's the National Intelligence Director and then the story that we, we brought you last week about the documents uh, recovered in the Abbottabad compound for Osama bin Laden, hundreds of thousands of them believed uh, to not have been released. We've only received 17 of them so far and apparently they tell us a lot more according to numerous uh, reports. Uh, take a listen.
The threat from core al-Qaeda and the potential for a massive coordinated attack on the United States is diminished, but the global jihadist movement is a more diversified, decentralized, and persistent threat. I think the files probably complicate the Obama administration's overall counterterrorism strategy and that they show there's a cohesive international terrorist network led by al-Qaeda that operates to this day and that al-Qaeda really isn't that close to defeat. Now, apparently, Charles, these show a lot more interconnected al-Qaeda steering even affiliates. And it completely undermines the Obama argument that before Election Day and even after Election Day that somehow because of Obama the threat has radically d diminished, which also implies that it was the Bush administration and all the, the things it did, uh, invading Iraq, etc., which was the recruiting element that augmented the jihadist. In fact, that's not true. That didn't affect, as we can see today, it's spreading today w w without a Bush administration without Iraq uh, and with a new Obama administration that opened itself up to the Arab world. So it is intrinsic enmity. It has nothing to do essentially with our policies. Do you think we'll see any more of these documents, Bin Laden documents? I have no idea. I've stopped for making predictions. <laughs> we should. I mean, they paint a very different picture than the one that's being presented. My question is, do these leaders of these intelligence agencies even know what's in them at this point?